too. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I <laughs> want to welcome our friends online, all the people in the building here. Everybody grab your Bibles and hold them up and say, this is my Bible. This is my Bible. <laughs> I am what it says I am. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I have what it says I have. And I can do what the Bible says I can do. And I can do what the Bible says I can do. Today I'll be taught the Word of God. And I boldly confess. And I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. My heart is receptive. And I'll never be the same again. And I'll never be the same again. Never, never, never in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. It's funny, kind of a take two thing <laughs> on that. Uh, I just didn't know how long it was going to take to do that. I was, when, when Michael came in earlier, I just got to tell on myself, okay? He, he kind of sat over there, but, you know, left an empty table here. And I was like, Michael, would you mind sitting over here because of the optics of the camera? And then as we were worshiping, God was like, when have you ever cared what people thought? Oh. So I went up to him, you know, as we were doing the offering and everything, I said, I'm sorry, you know. I don't care what people think. I don't care if there's an empty table there. So, Oh, oh. Okay. Take three. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, everybody turn to Revelation, Revelation chapter 14. <laughs> now, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we, we talked about the seven trumpets, right? Before that, we talked about the seven seals. So today, we're going to continue that process. But there's something interesting that happens here that I really want to point out to everybody as we get to it. We get through it pretty quick here. So, but we'll, we'll get there. Everybody, Revelation chapter 14? Yes. Hey, it's weird when we start all over again. Everybody's there. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> and I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount, on the mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his Father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as if it were a new song before the throne. And before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and unto the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now I want to stop there for a second. There is a, a group called Jehovah Witnesses that, you know, they're, they're one of their teachings. And you, you know, they're, they're happy to tell you about it, so I'm not really calling them out necessarily. But they believe that the 140, the, that they are the 144,000. Okay, I submit to you, unless they're all male Jewish virgins, according to what we just read, they're not. Okay, even though this is in a last time scenario, what has also been misinterpreted is people have said, well. These are the 144,000 that uh, are left from the tribulation that are going to go out and, you know, evangelize and do all of this. No, it, it talks about here that these people, they follow the Lamb, whithersoever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits of God. So, I submit to you that these are Jewish people from the 12 tribes of Israel that were redeemed way before Jesus came. And then they followed Him. Okay? So, if you're a Jehovah Witness and you're listening to this or you know somebody, get into a good church. They don't teach truth there, okay? 
according to the Bible. Anyway, and, verse 6, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. You know, people want to talk about this great last end time revival, and well, gosh, you know, how do we know if the gospel's been preached? Because Jesus can't come back until the gospel's been preached to every, every nation, everybody, right? Here it's talking, there is an angel that does that. Now, rarely in the Bible does it talk about angels doing our job to preach the gospel. But here's a place that's very specific to make sure that on this last time period, I'm going to call it, that the gospel is preached and no one is without excuse. Because it says, to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and every kindred and every tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. And worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of the waters. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is falling. And <laughs> this is interesting because the word Babylon, if you look it up in the, in the Greek, it's a type of tyranny, wormwood, bitterness, or calamity. That's what it's talking about Babylon here. So people try to like, well, gosh, what, what is Babylon? Where is Babylon? Is that the new Roman Empire? Is that, they're, they're trying to put a geographic location on it. But the definition of it is a type of tyranny, wormwood, bitterness, and calamity. Okay. But Babylon has fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive the mark in his, in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of his holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. So, if you want to go back and, and read about the mark of the beast, talking to a lot of people out there too, it's in the previous two chapters. So, check that out. You know, it, it'll lay some foundation for you for what's happening here. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest, day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith, faith of Jesus. Okay, if here is the patience of the saints, and here are they that keep the commandments of the faith of Jesus, I think that's us, right? Okay, and I have always contended, still do, just because it's what the Bible teaches, that during the tribulation part, the Christian's going to be here. You know, the church is going to be here for that. And we're going to look at something here in a second that will help reinforce that truth on this, okay? And when, oh, I, okay, let me just keep going because I'm, oh, I want to go ahead and jump ahead of myself, but I'm not going to. And I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. So if you're in the Lord, there's going to be people here that are in the Lord during that time, right, that are going to die. Yea, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, 
having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Now, you know what a sickle is, right? It, it's a gathering hook is what it is. You know, p people have kind of taken a scythe, which is kind of a sharp, curved instrument at the end of a long stick that's used to cut. Well, a sickle resembles that, but it's used to gather. Hmm. Little difference there, okay? But it's a gathering hook. And I mean, like I said, this is the Greek definition for it, so. So if he looks at on a white cloud, like unto the Son of Man, who's he talking about? Having on his head a golden crown, in his hand a sharp sickle, and another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, thrust in the sickle, or the gathering hook, and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. I contend that this is the rapture. This is what we refer to as the rapture. Now, if you look at it in the context of everything else that, that we've looked at and read, at this point we've gone through the seven seal ju judgment, the seven trumpet judgment, right? I'm, okay, I'm, uh. <laughs> In verse 17, and another angel came out of the temple which is hev in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters. And the word clusters there is a bunch of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. When do you do a harvest? When things are ripe. When it's fully ripe. Not when you've just planted something. I'm not going to, if you want to see this, it was a couple weeks ago, go look at it. But we talked about this, that the harvest time isn't for the new seedlings. It's not for things that have just been planted. It's not for things that aren't ready yet. That's not when you harvest. But Jesus does his harvest when things, which are us, the earth is fully ripe. And the angel, verse 19, thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it. Now he's talking about the vine. He's not talking about the fruit. Okay? If you pull fruit off something and it's like a grapevine or something, I mean, the, the, the vine at that point, of that particular thing, it's no good anymore, so you get rid of it, right? And that's to be discarded. Gather the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horses, bright horse bridles, by the space of about 1,600 furlongs. Everybody do the math real quick on how many furlongs that is. That's about 200 miles, 200 square miles. I had to Google it this morning just, you know, to make, make sure I was up on that. And in chapter 15, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, Seven angels having seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Okay, now I want to stop here, keep your place where you're at right now, and go over to 1 Thessalonians. Because, see, this is one of the things that a lot of the, I'm just going to call them pre-trib preachers, the ones who teach that, 
you know, uh, Jesus is going to come back before the tribulation. You're not, you're not going to have to do it. This is one of the scriptures and verses they use. Everybody from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And they talk about this. And they talk about, oh, how good God is and how He wouldn't want any of us to suffer, any of us to go through anything. So it says here in ver chapter 5, verse 1, but of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all the children of light and the children of the day. We're not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as you also do. See what he says there? In verse 9, for God has not appointed us under wrath. These other judgments that have happened, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, there's going to be a lot of devastation going on there, right? We, we can all agree on that. That's not the wrath of God. That's not God's wrath. What's about to happen here in Revelation, that's God's wrath. So to disregard the other things, and that's why I think that so many people have taught that, oh, you don't have to worry about the mark of the beast because you're not going to be here for that. Well, according to this, yeah, you are. So, but even during that period of time, that's not God's wrath. People have bunched all of it up. Judgment isn't wrath. It's not. It's judgment. Now, if I have earned and deserve a repercussion in my judgment, that might feel like wrath. It's not wrath. It's still just judgment. You, you can't mingle all of this together and say, well, the whole thing is everything, because it's not. Especially when the Bible separates it and differentiates it one from the other. Is that clear? Okay, I'll, I'll quit beating the dead horse for now. And according to this, these are, these are the seven last plagues. Verse 2 of chapter 15 of Revelation. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. Okay, who is it that we read earlier that's going to have the harps? When, when, when you look at it, it's uh, da, 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 da. it's that new song they were singing, the 144,000, okay? And they sang the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works. Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? 
for thou art only, for thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. We, we went to a, a Greek festival Friday, and it was, it was awesome. And th there was an opportunity to, on, you know, to go on a, basically a tour of their sanctuary with the, the priest you know, leading the tour and explaining a bunch of things. And something that he said that really stood out, they called God, not the I am, but the one who exists. Remember that? Yeah, the all existing one. I mean, it, it's kind of the same thing, the I am, but when you say he's the all existing one, he exists. And, and that's that same context here that they're talking about that for thou art alone art holy. He's the only one. In verse 5, and he said, And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony of heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Now the wrath of God. At this point, the church is gone. The Christians are gone. Okay? He's thrust in his gathering hook for us already at this time. Now this is at the end of the tribulation, according to this, we're not here anymore. We've seen some things during this time. We've had to endure some things during this time. We've had to reject the mark of the beast at this time. So by now, all these things have already happened. So the next things that happen, and they will happen unless God's a liar, so it will happen, because he's not. In verse 8, And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from, and from his power. And no man was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. <laughs> this is awesome. It's, have you ever stood in line to get in somewhere? You know, that's how this is going to be. Like, we're there. We're in heaven at this time. We're ready to go to this, to enter in. It's like, no, no, no. You can't enter into the temple yet. We still have to, some things still have to happen. So we're, we're still having to wait in line for this. In chapter 16, and I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. Okay, so... Who does this happen to? People who've received the mark of the beast, worshipped his image, the ones who've rejected Christ, the ones that are left here still at that time. This is what they're going to be going through. Bye, Eddie. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man. And every living soul died in the sea. Remember what happened when the angels poured out their vials in the sea earlier? It was what, a, a third? But now things have escalated. Things have changed. Now every living thing 
It's, an, it, it, it's all of it gone. Because it says every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of the waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shall be, because Thou hast judged this. See, when God judge, it's a righteous judgment. Now, does it feel righteous to the people that are experiencing this? All the ones, all the fish in the sea, the animals, etc.? No. It's a horrible thing for them. But what does this angel do? Pouring out, he's like, God, I worship you. I honor you. You're righteous. This is right. This is good. Whew. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they're worthy. Now you see what these people are worthy of? They're worthy not of heaven, not of salvation, not of forgiveness, not of righteousness. They're worthy of God's wrath. And to blood to drink, for they're worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God, almighty and true, and righteous are thy judgments. That was kind of a rant. That wasn't one of the other ones. This came from the altar. Okay, this isn't one of the angels pouring out anything. It's one that recognizes from the altar what's happening here. In verse 8, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. I guess that's global warming, right? <laughs> I mean, people have put this new title on something that God has said is going to happen. And all because they've done this, and well, this is what causes it, and this is what causes it. You know what? It really doesn't matter what they recognize as what causes it. The thing is, God intended it. And because God intended it, if He wants to use greenhouse gases or whatever to accomplish that, if He wants to use fracking to accomplish whatever, if He wants to use, I guess, emissions or cow farts, you know, whatever, to accomplish this, it doesn't really matter how it gets here. The thing is, God said it's going to happen. And frankly, it's His earth. He can use whatever He wants. If He chooses to change the atmosphere and the protection that the earth has around it to burn everything up, He's God, it's His, He can do what He wants. Fair enough? Hmm, I feel like I stepped on a toe there. <laughs> Not necessarily someone in the room here. Verse 8 again, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scourge, scorched with great heat and blaspheming the name of God. What? You mean that didn't cause them to repent? But they blasphemed the name of God, which had power over the plagues, and they repented not to give Him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain. 
and blaspheming God in heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. Everything in here, the, the time for repentance is over. There is no more, God, I'm sorry. There is no more forgive me, God, at this point. The time has passed. Now is judgment. Now is the wrath of God. Well, okay. In verse 12, and the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up. And the way of the kings, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And you know, the people, people have talked about this. And you know, we talked about the Euphrates a little bit in the past. That, you know, it is kind of drying up a little bit. You know, not to the point that those demons have been released yet. But that is an event at the Euphrates that is happening. That's not necessarily this event, though. Okay? All because it's mentioned here, it's part of the process of that, but it doesn't mean that this is that. Does that make sense? Can somebody explain it to me later? <laughs> And that, that the kings of the east might be prepared. What's been said, and I don't have any problem with it at this time, is when all the kings and like China comes from the east and they can cross the river Euphrates on dry land to get to Israel at this time. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Who's the dragon? Satan. Okay. Remember Revelation 12? Okay. So he's the dragon. Who's the beast? It's the leader, just the incarnate Satan, his, basically his, his offspring, his son. And then the false prophet. And quite frankly, there's a bunch of them. But this is one specific, one very specific. Oh, and I can't tell you who that is because I don't know. Okay. Verse 14. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world and to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they shall see his shame. See, even in this, that that there's a warning the guys as I'm telling you this repent you don't have to go through this you don't have to experience this he's not saying here blessed are they you know right here that re repent in the midst of this that time's already passed he's acknowledging that in the midst of this realize if you've already made that decision, it's okay. He's confirming and reinforcing and encouraging us in the midst of all this calamity that's happening. That it's okay. It's okay. And he gathered them to, together into a place in the Hebrew tongue. It's called Armageddon, which is in the valley of, the, of Megiddo. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven and from the throne saying, it is done. It's done. Now, keep, keep in mind, these others, they're poured out over rivers. 
they're poured out over the sea, they're poured out over beasts, they're poured out over uh, fountains. They're poured out in this atmosphere. Now this one is poured out into the air. Verse 18, And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as not since men were on the earth, so mighty an earthquake, and so great. This is one singular earthquake, the largest one that the earth has ever experienced. Now, through these other seven, like the trumpets and the seals, were there earthquakes? There were. So, a lot of people are going to misinterpret in the half. They're like, well, wait a minute, this is an earthquake, it wasn't that bad. You know, this wasn't that, this wasn't that. Well, no, it wasn't that. Don't think this was that. Because what happens now is different than what the earth's already experienced. And people, I don't know why people do that. They just try to lump them all in together. But then when there's that one significant one, they're just like, oh, I guess that's already happened because, I, but no, this is, this one's different. And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. Now, think about nations. America's a nation, right? China's a nation. Australia, that's a nation, right? China, Japan, Iran, these are all nations. So even though those cities might not be here in the Valley of Megiddo during this time, this earthquake is so great that it does what? It causes, oh, gosh, where? It causes nations to experience it and fall. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Aren't you glad you're not going to be here for this? Okay? So some of the other things that we've been here for, the, you know, during this, and of course I'm speaking here past tense, but I'm speaking standing here, future tense, because we haven't experienced those things yet, but that's kind of what things are headed to right now. But for this stuff, we're not going to be here for it. Whew, I'm kind of glad. <laughs> Think about it. Every island fled away. Every island fled away and every mountain gone. That's a pretty, pretty significant earthquake. Every. And when God says every, he means every. There won't be any left of that. And there fell upon men great hell out of heaven, and every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hell for the plague was exceeding great. Once again, no repentance, just angry at God. Just angry. In chapter 17, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sits on many waters. And I'm going to stop there with that because that's a whole different thing 
in itself, and I, I can't do that in the time we have left on this. But I hope that I did get across today the difference between the seven trumpets, the seven seals, and then the seven plagues that are the wrath of God. That we're not appointed unto wrath. We're, we're, we're not. And when I say we, I'm meaning specifically those who have accepted Jesus, made Him their Lord and Savior, that do what He says to do. Not that say it, spray it, and hope they fool somebody, because He, he won't be fooled. He won't be fooled. But we haven't been appointed to that. When he thrust in his gathering hook, we get to go with him. You know, it won't take us as a thief in the night because we're children of the light. You know, uh, Farron was telling me earlier, a guy uh, came in Friday and he was uh, talking to him a little bit, you know, and he brought him in here to the sanctuary at the door, left the lights off. And you know, with no windows in here, it gets really dark when the lights are off, right? And he said, there's tables and chairs in there. So could you walk from the door over there to that exit sign without bumping into a table or chair with the lights off? And I tell you, I've tried that before. You know, being here by myself sometimes and the switches aren't really where I'm at. And instead of turning my flashlight on my phone on, I'm like, <laughs> sometimes I just do it to see if I can. Okay, I'll just say this. This is explains some little nicks and bumps and things that I have sometimes. <laughs> but I've, I've tried to go from there to there without bumping into anything. And I know this place pretty well. And without exception, if I'm, if I'm not walking like this, yeah, you know, that's kind of cheating, you know. But if I'm just walking at a regular pace, I'll bump into something invariably. And then sometimes it's the press box, sometimes it's this, sometimes it's a chair, I turn a little bit too quick, a table, it happens. And then Farron flipped the light switch on. I said, now you think you can do it? And the guy said, oh yeah, I can get from there to there now, easy. Why? Because there's light. And since the light of God dwells in us, we don't walk in darkness as the other people do. We just don't. And we are that light. And it's the same light that Jesus was and is, and what was it? He said that the darkness comprehended it not. We were talking earlier about how some of the people on this earth and in America, they don't understand us. They don't get it. They don't get our love for God, His favor on our lives. They don't get how we do what we do, how we maintain the joy that we have. And I'm not talking about Democrat joy, what they're talking about. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about true joy in the midst of adversity. They don't get that. They don't comprehend the light that we walk in. They can't. They would like that. I don't know anybody in darkness that would like the light. Just like when I'm walking from one end to the other, when the lights are out, I'd love the light right then. But because it ain't on, I'm going to bump into some stuff. To expect them to understand or comprehend it, 
They can't. They couldn't then. They can't now. They don't understand who you are, why you are, how you are who you are, why you are who you are. They can't comprehend any of it. They would like it. They want what you have. But there's only one way to get that. Repent of your sins. Turn to Jesus. Accept Him as your Lord and Savior, and then let go of all the other things. Because those other things that you're hanging on to, you, those are the things that will keep you out of heaven. Because part of knowing Him and serving Him and Him being Lord is doing what He says do. You have a choice. You can say yes or no. Those are the only two choices. There is no maybe in the midst of that. And guys, we're, we're in it so deep right now of these final days. So deep. That there might not be time anymore. So anyway, well, that, that took a quiet turn. <laughs> but anyway, it's still truth. Are we good? Yes, yes. All right. Father, I thank you and praise you for who you are, who you are in us, that you've given your son as a ransom for us. God, I thank you that we overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And we love not our life unto death. God, I thank you that we're children of the light and the darkness isn't in us because it can't be. I thank you for freedom. Lord, I also thank you for this food. God, I thank you for your provision to us in ways that we haven't even acknowledged you in. But I thank you for it, Lord. Hmm. Lord, bless this food that we're about to receive. In Jesus' name, amen.